one in three women have have bladder problems. 50% of women who've had children post-menopause will, will have, go on to have prolapse, which is really something people don't talk about at all. It's yeah. still very taboo. Uh, and one in 10 women need to have quite barbaric surgery. So the stats are crazy. But it's an issue that women, and particularly in the UK, it's just sort of accepted. Like, I'm going to have children. I'm not going to be able to jump on the trampoline. Or I might, you know, pee when I accidentally pee if I sneeze or laugh and so on. So it just sort of grabbed me as this, this huge sort of health problem. Uh, and that kind of then became, even though it's still within the sort of same area that I was working in, but really kind of pivoted in terms of quitting my job and starting a company. Our mission at LV is around empowering women through radical female first technology. So how do we do this? We look at neglected issues, taboo issues, things that other people don't want to talk about and therefore have lacked innovation. And we come up with really bold new solutions. So often um, our products have been in hardware, software component to it, but it's more than just finding a solution for women's neglected health issues. It's also around changing the conversation. And you now sit here as someone who has probably changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of women for the better. Thank you, Simon. And you are kind of part researcher, part innovator, entrepreneur, CEO, and role model to thousands of women. So my first question to you is, if you described yourself, what single word would you use? One word, goodness. Um, disruptor is how I'd like to think of myself. And why do you say that? Because I think disruption is about change and it's about not accepting the status quo. And I think whatever I've done in my career pre-LV or since LV has been around trying to change, change things, change the way people think about their health, think about their bodies in lots of different ways. So through technology, through education, whichever way, whatever tools we need, but, but bringing about some of that change and, and doing it. I suppose the word disruption is it's not just like simple change. It's actually going in and trying to change the status quo. So actually doing it in quite a, a, a brutal way at times. And have you always been someone that's been comfortable with change or did you learn to get comfortable with it? I think it's something I've learned. So, yeah, but I would say even since I was a student, I was always seen as a bit of a contrarian. And why is that? I think I just, well, I didn't have a normal teenage years, childhood. So my mum was uh, ill for a lot of my childhood um, with lots of stigmatised health issues. And so coming out of that, it sort of gave me a bit of a healthy disregard, I think, for what was seen maybe what other kids might have seen as normal or, or normal expectations. I was a bit sort of uh, a bit of a rebel. Yes, in my 20s, I was working in international development. I said it was sort of linked to, to, to the issues surrounding my mum. I was working at ActionAid as a policy research in HIV. I got my PhD in, in HIV and orphanhood in, in South Africa. So I loved my job. I loved my career. Um, and then I think the next big pivot was sort of the inspiration behind LV, which was when I became a parent for the first time in my early 30s. And um, as a woman, everything changes. You know, I'd gone from having a life where I was completely selfish um, in terms of thinking about what I wanted to do going after my career. And suddenly everything was about this, this, this baby. And, and particularly, actually, when I was pregnant, uh, there's so much focus on the health and well-being of the baby and nothing on the physical or mental health of the woman. And it was when I was in a Pilates class when I was pregnant and my instructor said to me, Tanya, the most important thing you need to do as a woman is look after your pelvic floor. And that was important for two reasons. One, because it was the first time anybody had said to me something about me and, and the, acknowledge the fact that my body was going through so much physical change. Uh, and second, because... Um, you know, it just wasn't anything I really knew about. And, and when I went to research it, it was just sort of mind boggling how, I mean, I just suddenly saw all these parallels with having worked in HIV. What, what's the, um, what's your view on the difference between how society and I guess companies deal with uh, male health issues, uh, sexual health issues or health issues generally, where every single person will have heard of Viagra or whatever it is, and female health issues. Because I hear you talking about it, and I, you know you conjure up what's happening in the male's world. Now imagine, I don't know what the budget is, but billions and billions and billions of dollars, and you're talking about something over here which seems to affect almost yeah. all, or 50% of women, as you said, and I didn't see the same coverage. When it comes to intimate men's health issues, there's actually a lot of taboo, and one could argue that men don't even talk to each other about these issues. You know, women might talk yeah. more than than men's, uh, and even erectile dysfunction. I don't think many men kind of own up to that or talk about it publicly with their friends. Um, I think with erectile dysfunction, you've also got this very neat solution, right, which is take a pill and it will fix it for you, uh, whereas some of women's health issues are, are more complicated. But you're absolutely right. If you look at within women's health, within the broader spending on health, it's tiny, like it's 4% 
of health spending on, on women's health issues. And I think that's partly because it historically across cultures, cultures which have been obviously led by men, they struggle with the idea of, of women's reproductive health, right? So that sort of repressed uh, women's ability to, to be able to talk about a lot of these issues uh, and still does so. Okay. Just talk me through when you were setting up, it was difficult enough for an entrepreneur to go out and raise money in, in what is a predominantly male dominated space in the VC space. Yep. Uh, you're going out there and you're pitching for LV yes. to say, here's the problem. This is what I want to change. This is why I want to change it. Just talk me through some of those early conversations. How do you get people interested and excited about pelvic floors in an industry which is predominantly male and where people are quite uncomfortable talking about things which are different? When I identified that pelvic health was a problem, right, so I started looking at what is the evidence, what works, what doesn't. And then along the way, I thought, well, actually, what we need is better technology. And you've got these awful medical devices that women have to go to hospital, uh, lie on a bed, have a vaginal probe, get cooked up to machine so yeah the simple idea is why can't we just design something that women could use at home that's effective and fun and convenient but that did mean having to start up a technology business you know it's a connected device there's hardware there's software there's firmware and as you know obviously the tech world is very very male dominated and okay I was about to say I don't want to generalize but I will generalize I would say on average men who work in tech are probably less open to talking about things like vaginas and sexuality and things than than your average man (laughs) so To your point, when we had to go and start raising money within the tech world, also this is 10 years ago, there are not many, uh, you know, as we know, there's there's a minority of female founders, you know, your average founders, what you think about tends to be white, male in their 20s, obviously I'm none of those things. Uh, And then on top of that, we were doing hardware, which is hard. And then it was a vagina product. So yeah, pitching to male investors, there's a lot of men who just, just, just were not able to to deal with that conversation and, and, and felt quite squirmish about it. So we'd actually do a test, right? So we have a product that goes in the vagina, we'd put it on the table and sort of see people's reactions. But then at the beginning, I was also quite nervous to to use certain language. Like I wouldn't say the word vagina, or I wouldn't quite explain, so I'd sort of talk about it quite vaguely. <laughs> So it was awkward to have those conversations. And also there's a tendency to then also make it personal, right? So you'd have uh, male investors trying to empathize on an issue that clearly they felt awkward about. So they would say, oh, I spoke to my wife and she says this is a problem or I spoke to my mother. And, you know, whereas I think as an investor, often you you don't want to be always looking at it from a personal point of view, right? So my challenge was to turn it into the commercial opportunity, which it, which I knew it to be and have proved since that it is, which is to explain the numbers. So I would focus more on the numbers. And then on the personal side, it's just recognizing that for many men, it it just was too awkward and they wouldn't get it, right? So they would just say it's niche, even though the numbers suggested not. But then I think with anything in feminism, when you're trying to bring about better gender equity and equality, you need men on your side. And there are many men who are on your side, right? So it's many men who will often know that their wives or their mothers are going through some of these health issues and they want to know how to help. And just listening to you talk about that whole journey, are you someone who, uh, who when you see things which are hard, you go, you see things which are really, does it, or is it almost more exciting to you the harder it is and the, and the more mountains you feel like you have to scale? Because most people are like, well, just setting up a business on its own is quite difficult, even if it does the same thing as someone else. And you're saying, well, I'm going to do femtech at a time when no one else is doing it. I'm going to talk about one of the most taboo things possible. And I'm going to set a company yeah. up, which is going to need tens of millions of pounds to scale. And I'm okay with all of that. <laughs> uh, it was that, was that just the journey? Or did you think at the right beginning? I'm, yeah. No, I'm not afraid of that. I'm going to be fine. Well, I'd say two char- one one characteristic is naivety. It did cost tens of millions, but I didn't realize <laughs> at the time. Um, but no, I wasn't scared. Uh, I don't know if I understood, again, naivety. I don't think I knew how difficult it would be. Um, so it wasn't like I was like, oh my God, it's going to be really difficult. I want it to be difficult. I want this path. It was more, I was just, I'm just bloody minded, right? So if I know, uh, I, I had such strong conviction, right? So when investors say to you, and and often they do, right? I don't believe in you. I don't believe in your team. I don't believe in this problem. I don't believe in the solution. I just thought, you don't know. You're idiots. Sorry, it it makes me sound arrogant, but I I was so focused and I knew that this was a problem for women. And I just knew if I could get the right solution out and help women, and maybe that's a bit naive, but the rest didn't really matter. Like the rest would would work itself out. And the great thing is, you were right. And they were all wrong. Thank you.